Hello everyone, welcome to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in today's video I will be continuing with chapter 2 where I will be sharing biological molecules, specifically lipids. If you have just found this channel, you've just stumbled across it and you're starting your AS and A Level Biology journey or you're simply revising for the exams that are starting next year, then I will suggest that you hit the subscribe button and make sure you invite your friends to do the same. This channel is dedicated to the chronological content of the AS and A level biology syllabus so you can start from the exact beginning and follow chapter by chapter. So I will suggest that you hit chapter 1.1 which is another video that I have recorded in order to start from cells and microscopy. But if you simply need clarity on biological molecules then make sure you just continue watching. The first chapter for biological molecules is chapter 2 point one carbohydrates so if you watched my last video which is chapter 2.1 where I started with biological molecules you will remember that I said remember form and what form simply stands for is fatty acids organic bases amino acids and monosaccharides the point of form is to remind you of the monomers that make up the polymers we are studying in this chapter so for example fatty acids and glycerol make up lipids which is what we will be covering today organic bases and nucleotides make up nucleic acids amino acids when chained together make up proteins and monosaccharides when added together make up polysaccharides so this is just to remind you of that and to bear it in mind especially when you're dealing with biological molecules also want to say that for this chapter we are not studying nucleic acids but I just thought it would be important for you to have this foundational understanding before we get to the chapter where we do study them. So what are lipids? I have put this image here to just show you some of the lipids that might be in your kitchen. So for example coconut oil is a favorite for many people when they're cooking. Duck fat is also very popular. There's olive oil, which some of us choose because we believe it's healthier. There's butter. So if you're the type who likes to take toast with butter and jam, that's it there for you. So we have lots of lipids that we relate with on an everyday basis. And what we need to know about lipids is that they are organic molecules that are insoluble in water, which means that when you put a spoon of olive oil in a cup of water, for example, you will find that the olive oil will sit on the water and it would not mix with it so it's not the same as if I put a teaspoon of sugar in water after a while when I look in the water I can't differentiate between the glucose that I put in which is sugar and the water itself because they have mixed together glucose is soluble in water but things like lipids are not so, so no matter what you do they just do not dissolve in water something interesting also to bear in mind is that fats are so solid at room temperature. So things like butter um, tend to be solid at room temperature. Things like fat, duck fat, tend to be solid at room temperature. While oils are liquid. So your olive oil, your sunflower oils, your canola oils, um, those are liquid at room temperature. Lipids are formed by the reaction between an alcohol and a fatty acid. In other words, the formula for lipids is fatty acids plus alcohol. And we're going to go into detail to understand that. So this is an example of a fatty acid. As you might be able to see here, fatty acids are long hydrocarbon chains, which means they have a long chain of just carbon and hydrogen. And usually this length is about 15 to 17 carbon atoms long. And at the end, they have a carboxylic group. Some fatty acids have double bonds, while some of them have only single bonds. So as you can see here in this image, we only have have single bonds in the hydrocarbon chain. When we say single bonds and double bonds, please bear in mind that this does not include the carboxylic group. The carboxylic group on its own has a double bond where the carbon is double bound to oxygen. But when we speak of double bonds in fatty acids, we are looking specifically at the hydrocarbon chain. So if you look at this hydrocarbon chain, you will see here that it only has single bonds. There is no situation where the carbon is bound 
to hydrogen with a double bond. What this means is that this hydrocarbon chain is saturated. So we say that it's saturated because it means all the possible bonds for carbon have been formed. Just to put this out there, carbon is able to form four bonds in total. So if you can see, if you count, you will see that every carbon atom in this chain has four bonds attached to it. And what that then means is that it is saturated because it doesn't have a double bond anywhere in it. When it has a double bond, we call it an unsaturated fatty acid. So unsaturated fatty acids are very different from saturated fatty acids in the sense that in the hydrocarbon chain, you can see double bonds between the carbon and the hydrogen. If there is only one double bond in the hydrocarbon chain, we call the fatty acid a monounsaturated fatty acid. However, if there is more than one double bond, then we say it is polyunsaturated. So if you think of mono just being the word for one, and then I, when I say mono, I don't mean the illness, then you remember that no means one double bond, while poly means there are many double bonds within the hydrocarbon chain. So this is just an image to show you the difference between saturated fats and unsaturated fats in our foods. And so when you look on the left where the saturated fats are, you can see that there are lots and lots of processed meats and fatty meats. So if you go and you have a pork belly or pork medallion or whatever it is, you will find that that is saturated fat. It's very high in fat. Whereas with your unsaturated fats, they tend to be healthier. So you find them in nuts, in olives, in oil, in avocados, and even in some oily fish. So this is just a difference to show you how you eat can influence the cholesterol content of your body. So if you eat a lot of saturated fats, so like fats on the left hand side, you're likely to find that when you go for a cholesterol test, your cholesterol will be very high. So this is just an image to show you that. So I hope you enjoyed that fun fact. Let's get into the chemical side of things. So remember we said that when we form a lipid, we have a reaction between fatty acids and glycerol. Glycerol is actually a kind of alcohol. Alcohols have what we call the hydroxyl group. The hydroxyl group is denoted by the presence of OH. And what happens is that when a fatty acid or an acid with a carboxyl group, so an example would be a fatty acid, reacts with an alcohol that has the OH group, what happens is they produce what we call an ester. And the link between them is called an ester bond. What happens is that the carboxyl group will react with the OH group to form a ester bond and then release water as a result. So if you look at the formula for the carboxyl group over here, which is COOH, and you react it with OH, if you were to remove water from this, you simply remove the two H's and you remove the O from the hydroxyl group and you will be left with the COO. And that COO is denoted as COO minus. So if water is produced as a result of this reaction, what type of reaction is it? It is a condensation reaction because remember when we spoke about biological molecules discussing carbohydrates, we said a reaction whereby two compounds are joined together and water is released as a result is called a condensation reaction. The opposite of a condensation reaction is hydrolysis. Hydrolysis means that we add water to the compound that has been formed in order to get our reactants back. So to convert an ester back to an acid and an alcohol, we simply add water, which would be hydrolysis. 
Triglycerides are a kind of lipid. They are formed when a fatty acid combines with glycerol. Now, if you look here on the screen, you will see that glycerol has three OH groups attached to it. Each one of these OH groups will undergo a condensation reaction in order to form a triglyceride. The reason why it's called a triglyceride is simply because each OH group will react with one fatty acid chain. So this OH group here, the very first one, reacts with one fatty acid, the other reacts with another fatty acid, and the third reacts with another fatty acid. What that then means is that we will form a triglyceride, which basically suggests that there are three fatty acids that are attached. That's why we use the word tri. So there are three OH groups in glycerol, three fatty acids are attached to it. What you also need to bear in mind is that triglycerides are not soluble in water, just like we said of lipids. They are only soluble in organic solvents such as ether, chloroform, and ethanol. So if you work in the lab with triglycerides, you are likely to use ethanol as your solvent. So why are triglycerides important? So when you go to the clinic and you want to do a test for your blood fat content, for example, you will find that on your test card sometimes there is this section for triglycerides, there is the section for high density cholesterol and the section for low density cholesterol. Triglycerides are very important in the body because they are an excellent energy reserve. They yield more energy than carbohydrates because they have more carbon hydrogen bonds. This means that the fat that is stored in your body, for example, is a good source of energy for you. If, for example, you were to decide to go on a diet and you refused to eat any carbohydrates, what the body will then do is it will pick up on fat and it would use those fats to supply you with energy. So just to say a disclaimer, I'm not saying you shouldn't eat anything, uh, but I'm just saying that this is one of the principles that diets such as ketogenic diets are based on. They prevent you from eating a lot of carbohydrates so that your body is forced to use up fat. Fat is stored in various parts of the body, for example, under the skin to insulate us from heat loss. There is some fat under, around your kidneys to protect your kidneys. Fat also serve as a metabolic source of water, so when they are oxidized during respiration, they produce CO2 and water. So this reaction here on the left is just showing you how the reaction happens. So this is glycerol with its three hydro, um, hydroxyl groups and it reacts with three fatty acids. So this OH, C, O and then R is simply just showing us the fatty acid. What R represents there is the long hydrocarbon chain and COOH represents the carboxyl group that is at the end. So it is the carboxyl group at the end that reacts with OH and then you have three fatty acids in order to form a triglyceride at the end. Another kind of lipid that is very important for you to know, especially as we go on in biology, are the phospholipids. Now, if you've watched the videos on chapter one, you will remember that the cell membrane is said to be partially permeable. The reason why it is partially permeable is because it is made up of these phospholipids. Phospholipids are a very interesting structure in the sense that they have what we call a hydrophilic head. What that means is that that is a water-loving head. It relates well with water and they have two hydrophobic tails, which means they have tails that hate water. And phospholipids are formed when a fatty acid chain of a triglyceride is replaced with a phosphate group. But what you simply need to know is that you have these structures over here that are very smiley and happy um, and they have these two hydrophobic tails because the tails are made up of fatty acids which again like we said does not relate well with water because it's insoluble and they have a phosphate head on top that is water loving and relates well with water on the next slide i will show you how this looks in the cell membrane so this is a structure of the cell membrane. As you can see, the arrangement of the 
phospholipids in the cell membrane is something interesting and peculiar. If you look at it, you can see that the hydrophobic tails are relating with each other, which means they are on the inside of the cell membrane while the hydrophilic heads, so the phosphate heads, are on the outside. What this means is that on the outside where you have blood and it contains water and all of these other things that are traveling in the water, the phosphate heads are able to relate well with that environment. But they protect the hydrophobic tails by keeping them on the inside of the cell membrane. This is also very important because it is critical to the function of the cell. Because what this means is that only different types of compounds are able to pass through the cell membrane. So if, for example, a compound is a water-loving compound, chances of it making it through the hydrophobic tails is very slim, even though it would be able to make it through the hydrophilic heads. So you will see when we get to chapter 4, which is cell membranes and transport, how this plays a role in the regulation of the compounds that are allowed to enter the cell and the compounds that are allowed to leave the cell. But I hope this has planted a seed in your mind that phospholipids are able to control the movement of materials in and out of the cell because of this peculiar structure that they have of a hydrophilic head that relates with the water loving environment and hydrophobic tails that only relate with each other and try to prevent anything else from coming through. So if you think about it, for example, if you put a big dollop of oil on the on a plate and you tried to insert some water in the center of that oil, chances are you're not going to be able to to succeed because what the oil will do is that it will always try to find itself in the same way the hydrophobic tails are always trying to find themselves by binding to each other and creating what we call a hydrophobic interaction but we will go into more detail on that when we get to chapter 4 for now this is the end for me and I hope that you have enjoyed this lesson if you have any feedback any questions any comments please make sure you put them in the comment section and I promise to get back to you. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and watch out for more videos on the chronological content of the AS and A-level biology syllabus. Thank you for watching. Have a good time.